do, do I just uh, use the keys on the computer? Yeah, yeah. you don't have a... That's okay. Should I turn this on? Is this on. Oh, it's on. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much to Carol and to Samru for all that you guys have done to organize the talk. And thank you to all of you guys for being here on this rainy day and also at this time of year when it gets dark at 4 p.m. You must feel like you're here in the middle of the night. So I really appreciate you coming. Um, so as um, uh, Carol mentioned, um, what I'm going to do in this talk is summarize um, the arguments that I make in a recent book called Decolonizing Universalism that came out of Oxford at the end of last year. Um, of course, because I am summarizing the arguments in an entire book, the talk's going to be a little bit schematic. The good news is that since it's an already published work, I have answers to questions about the details, so you should feel very free to ask me about them in the question and answer. Um, the core question around which the book is oriented is the question of whether um, an anti-imperialist feminism is even possible. Um, because I know that um, not everybody spends their time thinking about sort of feminist complicity in imperialism or transnational feminisms, I want to give you a couple of examples from the world um, to kind of help motivate the question, like to help you see why somebody would worry that it was impossible to have a feminism that was not complicit. So um, the first one, which I now realize from talking to undergraduate students is a perhaps old example, um, is the use of um, feminist rhetoric to win hearts and minds to support the US, US invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002. Um, for those of you who remember that time period, um, what was often argued in that time was that um, the invasions of these countries were necessary because, um, and that part of the reason that they were necessary was that it was necessary to um, free women from the oppressive structures associated with Islam. Um, another example that is kind of go ongoing and that fewer of you may be familiar with um, is the um, the incursion of neoliberalism into the international development agenda, wherein we see that, um, the, that something that gets called investing in women is often used to, um, to sound like it's a feminist intervention, but often ends up resulting in um, interventions that do more to help the North than they do to help the South, or um, interventions that actually worsen um, gender relations and the gender division of labor um, in the countries that they affect, not to mention um, kind of break down important social networks and have other imperialist effects. But I'll talk a little bit more about that example um, in the sort of body of the talk. At any rate, um, these kind of vast literatures about feminist kind of complicity and imperialism have arisen in response to examples like these. People notice that feminist arguments seem to be being used to justify imperialist activity. Um, and then, and it seems like values are playing a role in the imperialist activity. Like, if th this were just a case of straightforward instrumentalization, where somebody is saying that feminism requires these activities, but in fact it doesn't, we wouldn't have a problem here. But it seems like, in many cases, values that are genuinely thought to be feminist values are playing a role in driving feminist complicity and imperialism. So um, the book is um, kind of a response to a dilemma that I refer to as the anti-imperialism normativity dilemma. So I have a description of that dilemma here. Um, the dilemma basically says that, and so it stems from the idea I have at the top, which is the worry that feminist complicity in imperialism is caused by the mere fact that feminism has values. Um, and if it is true that feminist complicity in imperialism is caused by the mere fact of feminism having values, then it will appear that we have this very bad choice. So we have a choice on one hand where um, we accept that feminism um, Feminist complicity and imperialism is caused by feminism having values and then say, as some liberal feminists do, well, um, when I engage in imperialism that is just required by having universal values, so I'm going to bite that bullet, so be it. Um, or on the other hand, we have, we, the other side of the dilemma is folks saying, well, I want to avoid imperialism and the way that I'm going to do that is by refusing to um, to avow any universal values, and then that seems to take away feminism's bite as a normative doctrine. Um, so 
As you might suspect, um, because um, I'm a philosopher talking about the, the dilemma, um, a lot of what I attempt to show in the book is that the dilemma is false. <laughs> um, the, the, um, what I want to show in the book um, is that the dilemma is false because it makes this mistaken assumption, which is that the values that cause feminist complicity and imperialism are the values that feminism needs. And what I want to show in the book is that, in fact, um, the normative, that the guest feminism requires universalistic normative commitments, but the normative commitments that it requires are distinct from the commitments that cause complicity and imperialism. And I sort of divide my, um, my critique of the idea that um, having values is the cause of feminist complicity and imperialism into two parts. Um, and basically, I, I say, um, well, one reason that the normative commitments that feminism requires are not, um, are not the same ones that cause imperialism is that, first, many of the values that promote feminist complicity and imperialism are, in fact, conceptually unrelated to feminism. So the values appear to people to be necessary for feminism, but when you actually look at what feminism is, it's um, something more like um, chauvinist or capitalist ideology that is driving the view that these values are necessary for feminism. Um, and second, um, I argue that, the, that yes, feminism requires normative commitments, but that missionary feminism, or like the bad kind of feminism, is driven not just by having values with the wrong content, but also with the wrong, or it's also driven by feminism espousing the wrong types of values. So, like if we formulated feminist values differently, I want to argue, um, then we um, might be able, if we, or if we understood the role of values in transnational feminist praxis differently, we might be able to come up with a less imperialist feminism. Um, okay, so <clears throat> that's what I'm doing overall in the book. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, kind of where I'm going to go in the rest of the talk. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to describe my positive view about um, how we should conceive of feminism in transnational feminist praxis. That's the view I describe as non-ideal universalism. Um, the second, and then um, much of what I do in the book is look at, since I'm saying, look, it's not feminism having values that's the problem, um, I end up saying, well, let's look at the specific values that are accused of causing feminist complicity and imperialism and ask whether they are actually playing a causal role. And so in the second kind of, in the parts two and three of the talk, I'm going to look at two of what have been the most controversial values in feminist debates about imperialism. In particular, um, the value of imperial, the value of individualism and the value of autonomy. And finally, um, in the last section, I'm going to talk about how my non-ideal universalist view solves another problem, um, which is um, the problem of feminism engaging in something that Laila Hulugan refers to as saving to. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to start with um, my view, my positive view about what non-ideal universalism is. Um, <coughs> so non-ideal universalism combines a view about what the normative content of feminism should be um, with a view about the role of values in transnational feminist praxis. So, my view about what the normative content of feminism is is one that I take to be um, relatively non-controversial. Um, one of the early people to articulate it in this way is kind of is Bell Hooks in the 1980s, where she says feminism is opposition to sexist oppression. Um, of course, to do something with that view, we need a definition of oppression, and there also, um, I think I do something relatively non-controversial and borrow Marilyn Fry's canonical view where she says that oppression is um, a relationship between social groups um, where one or some social groups are systematically disadvantaged in relation to other groups. So I want to flag kind of two features of the concept of oppression that are going to become important for my later arguments that individualism and autonomy are actually not as necessary for feminism as they are often thought to be. Um, and that's first that autonomy, or not autonomy, sorry, that oppression describes a relationship between social groups, not necessarily a relationship between individuals. Um, and that second, um, to say that, um, that oppression um, describes um, you know, a situation where some groups are disadvantaged relative to others, 
on its own is agnostic about what the indicators of advantage and disadvantage are in a given context. So nothing about saying that oppression is bad requires a spe very specific view about what the constituents of advantage in a human life are or should be. Um, so I've said that non-ideal universalism kind of couples a view about the content of transnational, of the content of the values that should motivate feminism are, and um, a view about um, the types of values that feminists should embrace, or more particularly, a view about the role of values in transnational feminist practice. So um, my basic view about the role that values should play in transnational feminist practice is that they should play um, either what Amartya Sen would call a justice-enhancing role, or what Charles Mills, who's in the room, um, would call um, a non-ideal theoretical role. What both of those views have in common that I kind of want to draw from is the idea that what we want values to do in the context of transnational um, feminist praxis, at least, is to reduce the injustice that is sexist oppression, rather than imagine um, what a perfect gender-just state would look like. Um, so, what my non-ideal universalism is ultimately going to show, I hope, um, is that, one, if we remember that feminism is about sexist oppression, um, and that that's the kind of normative concept that it focuses on, we will realize that, um, in fact, many of the values that people tout as feminist turn out to be conceptually unrelated or sometimes even practically undermining. Um, of attempts to end sexist oppression. Um, and second, um, I, I'm going to show, um, especially with regard to individualism, that if we, once we accept that the role of values in transnational feminist praxis is justice enhancement, we will end up seeing that um, some values that are putatively feminist, especially Western values imposed in places in the global south, actually end up impeding transnational feminist praxis rather than improving it. So that's sort of what my positive view is. I told you it was going to solve some problems, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit now about what the problems I think it solves are. So first, um, I think that my non-ideal universalist view um, allows us to resolve um, a number of the feminist debates about whether feminists <coughs> ought to be individualists. So, Part of why these debates need to be resolved is that, um, that individualism is thought by many people both to be very central to feminism and thought by others to be an imperialism justifying value. Um, I, I should say that part of why this one is particularly difficult to resolve is that people often think that feminists need to be individualists because it seems like um, many practices that feminists want to oppose, like the subordination of women to other members of the family, for example, um, seem to involve treating women as though they are not separate persons from other entities. So there seems on its face to at least be some kind of conceptual relationship between feminism and individualism. And that's why these accusations that feminism, um, or that individualism is imperialism causing, um, end up being particularly vexatious. So I'm going to focus in this part of the talk um, on one particular claim about individualism. Um, and that's the claim that individualism causes what I refer to, what I refer to as imperialist associational damage. So I just want to say a little bit about my methodology that has caused me to arrive at this point about imperialist associational damage. So a lot of the work I do in this book, because almost nobody in the discipline of philosophy works on transnational feminisms, um, is end up looking at social scientific literature that is feminist social scientific literature, so it's very normatively laden. But it's making these moral points, but making them in very case-specific and non-explicit ways. So a lot of what I do in the discussion of individualism in the book is kind of step back and say, I'm going to canvas all this literature about feminist critiques of imperialism and claims that feminism or that individualism becomes complicit in imperialism. And I'm going to try to find out what the underlying kind of abstract worry is. Um, in going through that literature, 
Um, what I have sort of concluded, and of course if this were a talk just about the individualism stuff, I would give you more evidence for now. You're just going to have to take my word for it. Um, but or I think, by book. Or by book. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> or read things that aren't written by philosophers <laughs> besides my book. <laughs> um, you should read that. No, but um, so I see the worry at, and I'm going to give you an example of it, but I see the worry as um, a worry that, um, that feminist interventions that are individualistic in the wrong kind of way um, fail to attribute the right kind of value to the relationships that women happen to find themselves in. So they fail to appreciate harm that would be done to women by um, undermining the relationships in which women happen to find themselves. So to give you, I describe kind of four different types of this harm in the book. I'm just going to focus on one for the moment to motivate this a little bit for you. Um, and that's the harm that I refer to as a neoliberal governmentality harm. Um, and I describe it extensively there using um, Lamia Karim's critical work about microcredit. Um, before I keep going, because with this particular example, can I just ask how many people in the audience have read something critical about microcredit before? OK, all right. It just, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, five years ago, no one had, and then so it seems like people now are more familiar with critiques. So I won't go into a ton of detail about all of the critiques, but I will describe Kareem's, one of Kareem's critiques in particular. So Kareem basically says that um, before the advent of microcredit in rural Bangladesh, um, women were like the poor kind of everywhere, or in most situations, rely very heavily on informal social networks for well-being. Um, in particular, um, they rely on um, one another to share money and food in times of scarcity. They share environmental care and dependency labor and so on. The worry about microcredit is that when it comes in, according to Kareem, it erodes these relationships by creating the view that the women should see themselves in competition with each other because now they are so they're all selling the same thing and one of them needs to succeed and the other ones need to fail. Also, she says that where people used to kind of informally lend money, um, microcredit creates a usury culture where now people feel that they need to make money off money that they lend other people. And so these networks from which women were genuinely gaining well-being become eroded as a result of something that was supposed to help them. And it sounds like you guys are not an audience I need to say this to, but I'll just add that if it seems like this is justified because the women's poverty is ended after the microcredit intervention, the empirical data do not suggest any such thing. <laughs> so it's very possible in these situations that women are left in a net worse situation as a result of something that was supposed to be a feminist intervention that empowered them. So um, what I wanted to do um, in the book is once I recognized that there was this harm called um, imperialist associational damage that individualism was complicit in causing, um, I wanted to understand whether this value was necessary, like what value was motivating imperialist associational damage, like what specific species of individualism was motivating it, and whether this value was really necessary for feminism. Um, so before I say a little bit about why I don't think it's necessary for feminism, I want to say a little bit about why the value is pernicious. Um, so the value I take to include these two views. Um, and these views are on your handout too, um, but it, um, the value motivating um, imperialist associational damage is what I call independence individualism, and independence individualism combines these two views. One view is the view that only chosen relationships are valuable, and the other one is that economic um, self-sufficiency is valuable. So, why I think that this, that this value ends up being pernicious is that it ends up neutralizing the harm of, um, of imperialist associational damage. To put it really simply, if only chosen relationships are of value, it becomes very difficult to see what you might have lost if your unchosen relationships become affected negatively through some type of ostensibly feminist intervention. Um, so I then wonder, though, because I knew kind of every philosopher was going to come and say to me, 
this, um, this independence individualism you describe, it just isn't individualism. Um, so I then wanted to know when it seemed conceptually not the same thing as the type of individualism that um, people would morally defend. Um, I tried to figure out kind of why people would think that there was a relationship. And I think the answer is that there's this other kind of individualism that I call personhood individualism, which is thinking that a person is a separate being with needs that are not, um, that are distinguishable from the needs of others. And that I think people think that um, respecting <laughs> independence, of that, that promoting independence individualism is the way to respect personhood individualism. So that the way that you make a woman count as a separate person is to make her economically self-sufficient. Um, and I think that part of the story that underlies that, like that makes this plausible to Westerners, if you dig really deep down, and I think Nyla Kabir's work on the history of development is really good on this, is that, um, that people have in their minds kind of a deep association with what happened in the West in the Enlightenment and kind of immediately pre-Enlightenment periods, where they think that like the advent of wage labor kind of coincided with a decrease in traditionalism, and because they think that traditionalism is the source of women's oppression, they think that um, giving women the ability to earn money is going to then um, reduce their subjection to sexist oppression. Um, I have here this little note that I just want to say for any feminists in the room because I see a lot of you. Um, uh, my critique of individualism here, especially like the, the neoliberal individual parts of it, dovetails with a lot of feminist critiques of individualism, but it also is saying something different. Like, to put a really quick gloss on it, my view isn't that the value is androcentric, although I am sympathetic to the idea that the view is androcentric. My view is that the value is getting its appeal largely from imperialist idealizations, in particular, like, an idealized history of what happened in the West. So, to return to kind of my normative points about independence and individualism, um, oh, I actually got ahead of myself and already kind of described that slide. Oh, although if you want an example of the imperialist idealizations I am talking about, I think um, this nice quote from Moderniza a modernization theorist puts this really well. Um, this is an early modernization text that says, like, look, we need to empower women to earn income. Why do we need to do that? Well, it will reduce women's attachment to, quote, roles dictated by custom and make women cease to be, quote, men's beasts of burden. So I think part of what you see there is this idea that economic self-sufficiency is going to undo traditionalism and make women count as persons, like they will stop being men's beasts. Um, okay. So now to kind of go to the more normative part of what I want to say about individualism, um, I think that um, this independence individualism is kind of both undermining of, like it's both conceptually unrelated to feminism and it's undermining of transnational feminist praxis. So to go to my first point that says problem one here, and this is kind of one of the more controversial claims I make in the book for at least I think it's controversial. I don't know, I don't know if other people do. Um, but certainly lots of liberal feminists think that this, um, this thing is controversial. Part of why I think feminism doesn't need independence individualism is that um, feminism doesn't conceptually need any kind of individualism. And the reason for that is that oppression is a relation that obtains between social groups, not between individuals. So it's conceptually possible to arrive at a view that is against sexist oppression that doesn't make any claims about the intrinsic separate worth of individuals. Of course, insofar, like, and this is a non-conceptual point, but if you find a society where counting as an individual is indeed a, um, a, an indicator of advantage and men have it more than women, of course then a reason to support personhood and for individualism for women is gonna kick in in that situation. But conceptually, it doesn't seem like there's any direct tie between the idea that, like, any idea about the importance of the separateness of persons um, and opposition to sexist oppression. Um, 
The two other criticisms I want to make of the idea that individualism is necessary for feminism are, are more specific to independence individualism, and they are these two. So both of the two things I'm about to say are versions of the point that if adopted, independence individualism actually exacerbates sexist oppression. So if adopting a value, and this is kind of a non-ideal theoretical point, like if adopting a value is going to end up forcing us into a result that's inconsistent with the value we're trying to promote, that might be a good reason to jettison the value. Um, and I think it turns out that independence individualism, in fact, undermines um, the project of ending sexist depression. So what I have here as problem two is one reason for that. So, and this one I think will be familiar to feminists in the room, but it's that the idea that individuals are econo should be economically self-sufficient exacerbates the gender division of labor. Um, to give sort of a two-second explanation of that, um, we know that it's a fact about humans that many of us are um, capable, incapable of being economically independent, and all of us will spend many parts of our lives incapable of being economically independent, like the most obvious example being in childhood. Um, so we know that it's a feature of human societies, and this is Eva Kate's argument, that we um, that we that someone will have to do the work of taking care of dependents. We also know that it's a fact that in most societies this work is very disproportionately distributed to women. And we know, and given that this is a fact about the world, we have reason to expect that that like that digging our heels further or doubling down on the idea that individuals need to be economically self-sufficient is just going to distribute that labor to women even more than it already does. Um, what I have here as problem three is a second reason that I think independence individualism in particular undermines transnational feminist praxis. Um, and that is that, um, and this is um, another kind of, I think, important innovation in the book, is that I argue that independence individualism neutralizes the transition costs of feminist change or obscures them. So by transition costs, I mean like costs that come about as a result of moving from one social order to another social order. So um, in this particular case, I mean moving from a less feminist social order to a more feminist one, to a social order that includes a lot of sexist depression to one that includes less or none. So I think that we need to stop imagining kind of the possibility of a costless transition from one social order to another, like there are always going to be costs. And I think that part of what feminists should be looking for in our values um, and in the normative concepts that we choose is concepts that sensitize us to those costs. And I think that an important worry about the idea that only chosen relationships are valuable is that it desensitizes us to those costs. So to explain a little bit about how that works, um, I think it's the case that individual women are often gaining objective well-being from the relationships that they find themselves in, even if the relationships are oppressive. So part of what that means in many cases is that they would have to lose something to, in moving, something that is genuinely valuable in moving to a more just state of affairs. Um, what I want to say about independence individualism is that it obscures that, and that I think that feminists should actually be looking for that. So very quickly, I want to give an example that I think will make this a little bit clearer. That comes from um, God's um, book, Muslim Women Need Saving. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with Abu God's work, she's been doing a, like generations of ethnography with a single Bedouin community in Egypt. Um, when she um, comes back in the most recent book, she meets this woman named Gatiba, who she says that you know, she has known for many years and who she thought was a proto-feminist. Now she meets the woman in old age and she starts talking about like, how you need a man who can rule. And Abu Lugat is a little bit puzzled by this at first. And then through talking with her, she comes to realize that what is going on is that she had lived her whole life expecting that she would be cared for in old age by an intergenerational household. Now her husband has died, her sons have moved out of the house, they're spending all their money on their kids and their wives, and what about her? So I think part of what's important to see and part of what Abu Ghabi is trying to draw our attention to is the fact that this woman did lose something with the erosion of this particular family structure, and that can be true even if the family structure was a, like, a sexist family structure. 
My point in bringing this up, though, isn't to say that, like, you know, the family structure shouldn't change, um, although I'm not sure that the change it has actually undergone is necessarily a good one. But my point is that we need values that help us see kind of what women are losing when they are asked to undergo changes to their relationships that, um, that, um, that would be necessary for feminist change, and that the idea that we only care about chosen relationships makes it impossible for us to see that. So for me, the idea that um, only chosen relationships are valuable is one that feminists should um, be, um, I was going to say be very skeptical about embracing, but I'd say something stronger. I think it's one that we should reject, and I think that the reason we should reject it is that it's impossible to successfully apprehend the costs of feminist praxis and who they fall to without being honest about um, what women gain from the relationships that they find themselves in. Um, okay, I'm going to shift gears from individualism to talking about another value that has been extremely controversial in um, feminist debates about imperialism, and that's the value of autonomy. Um, so my remarks are going to be focused on um, a value that I'm going to refer to as anti-traditionalist autonomy. Um, it's to give you kind of a short version of what anti-traditionalist autonomy is. Um, anti-traditionalist autonomy is the view that, um, or is a, the view that a person can only successfully be autonomous or free if she either rejects all inherited dictates, or she subjects all inherited dictates to questioning. So there's kind of a weak version and a strong version. The strong version says if you're going to be autonomous, you have to reject all of the dictates that you have inherited. So, like that's a fancy way of saying you have to reject your culture, your religion, etc. The weak version says you can only be autonomous if you are capable of stepping back and asking yourself, whether you want to embrace or identify with any dictate that you happen to have inherited. Um, I want to flag for people who are philosophers that I don't think that the variant of autonomy that I'm talking about as anti-traditionalist autonomy maps on to what most moral philosophers have referred to as autonomy in kind of the last 20 or 30 years. I do think it maps heavily onto some like modern notions of autonomy, and I also think You'll find this version of autonomy alive and well when political philosophers theorize about examples of, in particular, women that they think are not autonomous, even if they don't explicitly avow this view about what autonomy is. Um, I also want to kind of flag for folks who aren't philosophers that outside of the philosophical literature, the value that I'm talking about also gets called freedom and secularism. So, um, I think a lot of what is actually talked about in debates about whether feminists should be secularists ends up boiling down to a question about this. Like, should feminists believe that women need to be able to separate themselves from inherited dictates in order to be capable of being feminists? Um, so, a lot of what I have to say about anti-traditionalist autonomy happens in a conversation with the anthropologist Saba Mahmoud. Um, so, Mahmoud basically um, accuses what she calls the value of variously freedom, autonomy, secularism of justifying imperialism. And I think that she thinks it does it in two different ways. I distinguish two types of roles that values can play in imperialism and, and roles that autonomy in particular can play. So the first one is what I call a justificatory role. So a value plays a justificatory role in imperialism if it ends up making it seem like, um, like adopting that, um, a, by making, if, okay, the value plays a justificatory role in imperialism if, it, if the value seems to justify imperialist action. So if it seems like, um, if, the value makes it seem like engaging in imperialist action is a necessary part of feminist change. Um, a value plays a constitutive role in imperialism, and I think that this is actually what, femi like what most philosophers are more familiar with in conversations about post-colonialism, if the value is a part of a regime of cultural domination. So if it's a value like that is a parochial Western value that is foisted on people who don't believe in it for a morally arbitrary reason. So Mahmoud's view, in my view, is that the value of freedom or autonomy is bad in both of these ways. So she, um, 
she focuses on um, post kind of post 9/11 discourses about Muslim women, um, and she focuses on this particular movement that I'm going to talk about in a. Actually, let me go to the movement, and then I'll explain how it's justificatory, how justificatory and constitutive imperialism um, would work in relation to the movement. But basically, um, Mahmoud studies this um, Salafist movement in Cairo in the early 2000s. Um, the women in this movement are um, very conservative Muslims in a variety of ways. Um, but what's really central to Abu, uh, for to Mahmoud's analysis of them is that they have, I think, what many philosophers would recognize as sort of an Aristotelian view about how you become moral and how you develop moral habits. The view is basically this, that in order to become pious, you need to unquestioningly accept certain moral dictates that are handed down to you and try to live according to them. If you try to separate yourself from them and ask yourself, are these good values or not, you've already failed by the lights of this view. So to give you a really kind of schematic example that she describes in the book, um, so many of the women in this movement did not bail prior to becoming involved in the movement. Um, one of the women says, like, I spent a lot of time reluctant to bail because I was asking myself all these questions about what modesty was, but the reality is I needed to bail first and I couldn't understand what modesty was until after I had lived as a bail. So Mahmoud thinks um, that Western feminists will feel compelled because of their commitment to autonomy, liberalism, secularism, whatever she calls it at various points, they will feel compelled to try to destroy the form of life that these women have. Um, and I think she thinks that there's two reasons for it. One is um, the justificatory reason that um, feminists believe that um, one of the things that women need in order to successfully oppose oppression is the ability to distance themselves from and criticize the um, tradition. So it appears to many Westerners that um, destroying or loosening attachments to, um, to Islam or to Middle Eastern or North African cultures will actually be a benefit to the women because they will now be able to question the culture that's oppressing them. Um, Mahmoud thinks that the value of freedom, secularism, autonomy um, plays a like would require constitutive or what I'm calling constitutive imperialism toward these women because it would also involve saying that they ought to adopt a different form of life, like a form of life that says that says you have to question every dictate you inherit regardless of whether it appears religiously dictated or not. Um, <coughs> so. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about why, you know, why Mahmoud just can't be right, like in the way that she's describing it. Um, or, and I think that the reason, or like why it seems like she can't be right. And I think the reason for, like the reason that people worry that jettisoning autonomy is going to cause a problem um, is basically this. We live in a world where sexist and patriarchal practices are often defended on the grounds that they are traditional. So it appears, at least facially, that, well, how are you going to be able to criticize these practices if you aren't able to criticize or distance yourselves from tradition? From tradition? Um, I also think, and but this is my like psychologizing a little bit more, that there's another underlying reason that people think that anti-traditionalist autonomy is necessary for feminism. And, that's the underlying belief that feminism can only, feminist change can only come about like as a byproduct of the adoption of a kind of crude comprehensive liberalism. So um, as, as the result of the adoption in particular, in this case, of a secular worldview. Um, so what I hope my non-ideal universalist view allows us to say um, is that in fact anti-traditionalist autonomy is not required for feminism. So um, I'm going to make a similar move to the move that I made about individualism and claim that um, actually if we return to focusing on the value of oppression, um, we will see that the ability to distance yourself from a tradition or to reject a tradition wholesale is not in fact um, necessary for the ability to criticize sexism. Um, 
How I'm going to do that is just by pointing out something kind of simple, which is that um, sexism is an effect of social practices, and traditionalism is a claim about the origins of social practices. So if that's right, we can imagine situations where these two things come apart, right? Like we can imagine situations where um, practices are traditional and oppressive, sure, but we can also imagine cases where um, practices are traditional and not oppressive, or cases where um, practices are not traditional and oppressive. So just to give you a, um, and of course just to kind of remind you of Fry's view, what determines whether it's oppressive or not is how it situates gender groups relative to one another. So what we really care about, if we care about oppression, is like, how does this practice disadvantage one gender group relative to another? Usually, how does it disadvantage women relative to men, although not always? Um, and that can come apart from the question of where the view comes from. So just to give an example to motivate the, the, the separation between oppressiveness and traditionalness, um, I think it's actually quite evident if you look around in the contemporary United States that there are plenty of practices that are um, oppressive, but either not traditional or even more than that kind of defended as rejections of tradition. So the example of this that I like to talk about is like the expectation that women conform their genitals and sexual desires to the demands of misogynistic pornography. Um, defenders of this type of pornography often say that the reason that we should have access to it is that um, tradition has prevented us from having sufficient um, access to sexuality, and yet at the same time it seems like part of the effect of um, the actual pornography is to place more stringent desires on women than men and to, um, you know, we could list a lot of the other problems with this type of pornography, to subordinate women's sexual pleasure to men's and so on. Um, I want to focus though a little bit on the flip side of it, which is I think important for understanding the possibility of um, feminism without anti-traditionalist autonomy. Um, and it's this. I think that if we distinguish oppressiveness from traditionalness, um, part of what we can see is that it's possible to be a feminist on traditionalist grounds. So you might, this can't happen in every case, but it, here's where it can happen. It can happen in, case, in cases where you believe that the content of your tradition dictates in some way that sexist oppression is wrong. Um, so I often get accused when I talk to philosophy audiences about this of like, yes, you might have shown this, but this is a purely hypothetical example. Um, part of what I think is funny about that is that it's actually something that social movements all over the world are doing if you pay attention to them. And so I'm going to just give kind of one example of this to um, so that you'll believe me and to close the talk. Um, so, um, so many um, Islamic feminist movements operate based on the assumption that Islam dictates that some form of the view that sexist oppression is bad or that gender equality is good. So just to give you one example of what that might look like, um, I'm going to talk about an argument from Amina Wadud. I don't think it's by any means the only one, and in some ways she's a controversial representative of what I'm about to describe, but it's just a very clear-cut one, where she basically says in older work, like, I, um, I'm a Muslim, what that means to me is that I am not allowed to question anything that's written in the Quran. But then she says, that gives me reason to be a feminist. And the reason that it gives me to be a feminist is that, well, if you like look in the Quran, one of the most kind of well-worn claims in there is that one of the worst sins you can create, commit is this sin called shirk. Shirk is treating yourself as though you're equal to God. Um, and what is patriarchy? It's men putting themselves at a level equal to God rather than a level equal to women. So, if I'm right about that, like what we have here is a situation where a person is opposing sexist oppression on grounds that don't require them to search outside of or even question their tradition in order to oppose the, tra um, the tradition, or to oppose the oppression. 
Um, I know I was supposed to have a third section, but I think for time reasons, I'm just going to pause here. You can ask me about it later if you want, but I will look forward to your questions. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go. You're going to, so you have a question. <laughs> now you have to have a question. Come <laughs> on, Jeremy. Yes, no, no. Wait for Sumer and So, uh, first Sumer, you have time to think of your question. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I say so. <laughs> Lots of pressure. My, based on my tradition. <laughs> So I was wondering if we could say more about twists and children. Yeah. Because well, my my first question was like, can there be different types of individuals? Which you already answered. So my question now is like, does it matter who makes the individuals in uh, play? Because the reason why I'm asking this is because of uh, uh, my experience with. Uh, Feminists who are also super anti-imperialist and leftist, and when it comes to uh, talking about women, they sound like liberal liberals. <laughs> uh, but then, as you said, there is something about like making the claim to be a person. So I guess I was trying to figure out a way to understand personhood outside of liberalism to make sense of what I am hearing from the local actors. But, uh, I don't know. Well, I, I was wondering what you think about it, and I would hear more about it. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you, Samro. Um, so, I'll say a little bit about what my view entails, and then I'll say some more specific things about your question. So, all I'm trying to really do in the discussion of individualism, maybe in the book as a whole, is to take a negative position about what we don't have to believe. So, I'm basically saying feminism doesn't require adherence to any form of individualism including personhood individualism. And I feel like that's the bold part, is that I'm not just saying we don't need independence individualism, but also that we might not even need personhood individualism. Um, that doesn't mean, uh, well actually let me just say one more thing about why I want to make room for that. Um, it's, and this kind of goes to your point about who's making the individualism claim. I think that there are contexts where claims about personhood individualism, like the only way that they can be understood and work is as these kind of Western modernization type claims. Like some examples of where you might see that especially are cases where there are real kind of distances within Global South movements between elite women's movements and non-elite women's movements. And you'll find that like elite women's movements are much more likely to use the language of liberalism um, than um, non-elite women's movements are. But this is a, that's a big generalization, right? So, but all, but, Part of what I'm trying to say to, say to intervene in that debate is that like, actually just pointing out that women are separate persons like, isn't enough to win you the debate. Like, other things, other considerations matter to what um, feminist strategy you should organize on the basis of. And some of those considerations have to do with like, what's going to work in your context. So, and, that I can't really dictate as the theorist, and it's my suspicion that there are contexts where it's like that the, the personhood individualism language is going to work well, and that there also might be contexts where it's not going to work as well. And I think that this is kind of where, part of where my view about justice enhancement becomes important is that I, I'm trying to say like which specification of the normative concepts we should use in which context, like it's okay for us to care about what is going to work and speak to the people in the context. Um, part of why, so do I think it's possible to like appeal to a non-liberal form of individualism to, um, to do this? Yeah, maybe, and maybe personhood individualism is actually separable from liberalism. And I think a lot of people think that it is. Um, I think, for example, and I know this is a figure who um, people in this conversation tend to not like a lot, but I think that part of Martha Nussbaum's project seems to be to try to separate personhood individualism from the liberal, liberal tradition in particular. That's but nice. part of what? <laughs> um, Carol has a view about it, but she's trying, right? But, okay, but part of why I am not choosing that route, besides that I, I mean, part of why I'm not choosing the route is just that I think, like, philosophically, to be honest, that it's like, if I discover that there's not a conceptual relationship there, then I have to step back. 
But the other reason is to leave open the possibility that you could have feminism in a society that didn't have personhood individualism as a value. And of course I want to tread really lightly there because I think there's a lot of people love to claim that there is no personhood individualism in societies where it seems like what's actually going on is that men get personhood individualism and women don't. Um, I'm worried about that. But it also may be the case that people have like value ontologies and social ontologies where that don't claim that being a separate person is the most fundamental part of your, like, is, is the most important thing for a moral code to respect. And you could imagine that happening in non-sexist ways, like to make up a silly version of it. Right? Like we could imagine a society that said like everybody fundamentally is the child of their parents. Like if that view was not gendered, like if that was not gender differentially distributed, I kind of think, well then there's not specific feminist reason to worry about it. Does that start to answer your question? Thank you. Um. <clears throat> I, I just have a really naive clarificatory yeah, sort of question um, about... Speak for yourself. <laughs> and maybe you said this and maybe I missed it, but yeah. I'm just wondering about the non-ideal, um, what the signification of non-ideal, I think you said you got it from yeah. um, Professor Mills's work. Um, so what's the difference between like an ideal universalism and a non-ideal universalism? Yeah, so... Um, a non -I an ideal universalism would say, like, we know, and I was going to get into this in the third section, and I'm sorry I didn't get deeper into it, but an ideal universalism would say, like, in relation to gender justice, like, we know what gender justice looks like. We know what the end state that is gender justice looks like. And what we want transnational feminism to do is to produce a value that tells us what the end state of gender justice looks like. And part of what I'm saying is, um, one, we don't, like, it's basically, we don't need that. And two, like, having that could get in the way of actually bringing about greater gender justice. And that, in fact, I think that is what is going on with regard to, like, the ideological connections between supposed Western values and gender justice. That, like, people have in their mind that the West, I mean, there's a whole section of the book about this, but that the West has done this particularly good job at achieving gender justice because of its values. Now that we know that, how do we reduce sexist oppression? Well, we install that same social form everywhere. Um, and I'm trying to say that's not, we don't need that to have a universalism. We just need universalism about the view that sexist oppression is wrong. Um, and that one, there's, I think, a lot of upshots to it, but one that I haven't mentioned yet in the talk that might be important to mention is that, um, and this I borrow, I get, I get more kind of inspired from Sen than from Professor Mills on, but about, I'm particularly, oh, he's crying. <laughs> what did I do? No, um, but that, um, that one worry about the bad kind of idealization is that it, ends up resulting in monism about what justice looks like. And so part of what I think is nice about the non-ideal universalism um, is that it's a universalism about what's wrong. And you could we could have agreement about what's wrong without having agreement about what the ultimate end state is. And that, in fact, like we could even be pluralists about what the acceptable end state looks like. Like there may, at the end of the day, be a variety of different social forms that have managed to eliminate sexist oppression, but that don't look alike in a variety of other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try uh, Susan. Hi. Um, so you make a pretty convincing argument for why feminism doesn't need independence individualism as a value, but I'm wondering about independence itself, um, valuing independence uh, women's independence from men. And I think about Simone de Beauvoir, you know, the last chapter of Second Sex is Independent Woman, and uh, she said that we women need to have an independent existence and not just have their being be dependent on men. Um, so is there a way to promote women's independence from men without promoting individualism? Um, so there may, okay, so there may be a way to do that, but I just want to point out that my view is compatible with, like, it's not a criticism of my view if there is a way to do that, right? Like, my view is just saying we don't have to do that. So it's, like, 
it would be probably an auspicious thing for like comprehensive liberal Western feminists if it turned out that we could do what you're talking about. And my view would say that that's fine if it can be done successfully. Um, but um, my point, like two points that I want to make in response to that are one that it's not obvious that independence from men, even in the West, is producing like the end of sexist oppression. So, like one reason that it's not is like the gender division of labor and dependency. So unless like this system of independence from men creates some alternative set of social arrangements for managing dependency labor, we should expect that women are going to continue to be subordinated. Um, this, I'm not saying that it's impossible, like that you couldn't do that, or like you could imagine on to, like having fully subsidized care work or something on top of independence from men. Um, yeah, it's a way to do it. That doesn't mean that it's the way or the right way, and we have to look at the other issues that it brings up. But kind of more importantly, and this is my second point, is that just because that might be a thing that you could do, doesn't mean that like that it will work in every context or that it's the best way to get rid of sexist oppression in every context. Like I think it's a little bit of a fetishization of independence to say that like in every context women need to be independent of men. Like women need to be rid of asymmetrical dependence on men that causes them to be vulnerable to lots of harms that men are not vulnerable to. Um, but the only solution to that is not independence, right? Like it might, the, I say, this is one of the things I say in the book, but a better way, like in some context, to avoid domestic abuse might be to go get absorbed into another collectivity that isn't your husband or something like that, but that can provide you with lots of advantages that going off to like can compete in the capitalist economy by yourself might not. And um, one of the examples I talk about there is an example about um, interventions in the lives of Aboriginal Australian women for whom like it's often thought that like the, what they should do based on kind of what settler populations should do is that women should separate like if they are victims of violence they should separate from their families but if separating from your family one isn't valued in its own right but also if it's going to result in your experiencing lots of violence at the hands of settler society like why this value rather than another value that would be equally capable of reducing the oppressive part of the relationship. Great. Great. Thank you. I want to ask about traditional I think there, I think there's, a, there's an issue there for me that I'm comfortable <coughs> with um, because I think the the tradition that you're talking, you're critiquing, which I've done some critique of too, is yeah. the view that saying no is liberatory and saying yes, I will continue is not liberatory. Yeah. So it's the negation, so the enlightenment, you know, yes. it's always like saying no. And um, but the other, but well, related to this is this question of what is tradition and what are cultures, and they're always because you know, they're often seen as these. Um, fixed, you know, stable, bounded things that don't require interpretation and don't change. I mean, what, what Duda is doing there is she's making an interpretive argument against other interpretive arguments about how to interpret Islam or the Klan. And it's the same with every Jewish mind, Catholicism, which is my <laughs> and my favorite Catholics are the nuns on the bus, right? The nuns on the bus argue that um, women taking more leadership roles in Catholicism is consistent with um, the tradition, and that what the you know the the denial of women's capacity to play that role is not in, is not in I mean, there are certain things that for both Christian and, and Catholicism, you have to accept. You have to accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You, you know, if you want to, if you want to convert, you, you have, there are certain things you have to accept that the Holy Spirit, or, you know. Or, so, I, you know, so there is a, 
factor to it of acceptance um, in you know in both these specific traditions, but there's also interpretive elements, and I but I don't want to say involve negation as the only privileged relationship to the tradition, but you, you see what I'm saying? So it's not it's not just that some traditions are not sexist, it's that tradition is always subject to interpretation and dynamic. Yeah, I think I just agree with that, and I think that I'm trying to offer like a um, an explanation of what's going on in the reinterpretation. Although one thing I might disagree with you about is it sounds like you're ceding more ground to like the power structure about the religion than I would. So it, you're saying that Wadud is engaged in a reinterpretation or that the nuns are engaged in a reinterpretation and we know it's a reinterpretation because the Pope says you have to like believe XYZ to be a Catholic. And I'm tr I think that some of the people who are engaged in this type of practice think that they're engaged in a reinterpretation. But I also think some of them think that they are recovering the original view. Um, and I want to make room for that too. So like one thing that, and I think that this is also true for Catholics, it's just that in Islam there's like a very clear story to be told about it. Like that a lot of um, what some Islamic feminists, and I should say that I'm not, I don't think Islamic feminism is the only thing that, like the only feminism that Muslim women should do or embrace. Like there's debates about it and whether it should exist in, in its, like in which context. But like if you are going to go down that path, one of the arguments you have available to you is that like the true meaning of the Quran was lost when women stopped being allowed to interpret it centuries ago. And so if you're, if that's the path you're going to take, then you know, other people might say you're reinterpreting, but you might want to say back, no, like, you're not, you're reinterpreting, I'm trying to recover what was originally there. So I guess I'm, um, I'm trying to say, like, look, you can often offer non-sexist interpretations of traditions, and I'm not going to take a stance about whether they're truly negations or affirmations. Like, Partly because I think that they could be either in different cases, but also maybe more controversially, I think I'm not convinced that that's a question that ever can really truly be answered. Like, what is the original truth of the tradition? Jesse would be a defender of any situation. Well, if you not defend it, you would ask a question mm -hmm. about autonomy. Uh, so I guess my question is, suppose that yes, so I take your point of view, then I can kind of jettison these autonomy concerns. Uh, which, I mean, I, you know, I, I see the argument, and I think it's, it's interesting. I guess my question is, what, what then would you say, because I think there would be at least like one sort of fundamental concern of feminism that seems to maybe require some concern for autonomy, and that's sort of the feminist concern about the gendering process, right? So, you know, I take many countries to be very concerned with the idea that, you know, one of the sort of harms, you know, sort of, uh, at feminist concerns, people being raised and gendered in particular ways, right, dressed in pink. Blue, right? And then, you know, mm -hmm. right? We know, we know the story. Uh, and I guess the question would be: I, I feel like you, could, you know, you have sort of two views about this, right? You say, well, one one problem with the harm of gendering is that the sort of genders are unequal, right? One is subordinate in some way, right? like femininity is in some sense like subordinate to masculinity, and that's sort of problem. And it seems like yeah, then feminists would have to say this is a problem. But then there, you know, there's a string of people who say, well, no, you know, why well, I think that in fact that might be sexist to think that femininity is in some sense subordinate, right? It might just be that people are sort of sorted in these, you know, there's sort of these two norms applied to people, and you know, they're different, but you know, maybe each has its own pros and cons, uh, right? You know, and the thought would be, I mean, at least take a strand of feminist to be, to, at least still to be tempted to be like, there's still something objectionable about this, right? Suppose we think that people are sorted into these genders, you're sort of trained from birth to perform a certain set of norms, right? you never critically evaluate it, and then you end up living sort of these very distinct gendered lifestyles as a result. Right? I take you know, a strand of feminism to think that's objectionable, even if we don't think that one is sort of in some sense subordinate to the other. Yeah, so I think if I understand your question right, I mean, I just think that that, so all I have to grant for my argument is that that is a strand of feminism, because all I'm trying to say is that feminism doesn't have to be this. But that strand, I'm even reluctant to say that that really is a strand of feminism. Like, 
because it sounds like it's sort of like just a libertarian set of views appended onto feminist concerns. It, at least like the way that you described the, the, the harms of gendering in that view, it sounds like they're the same harms that just, like harms that come about as the, a result of any socialization process. So um, I, for, like in all of my work on autonomy, find it like implausible that um, merely being socialized is a harm because we couldn't avoid being socialized. So, yeah, so I'm not sure why I should grant that that view is a part of feminism. The other thing that I want to point out quickly, though, because I think there certainly are gender rings that are harmful, right? Like, they're, like there are systems of gender that, like, you know, force people into roles that harm them and expose them to violence and so on. But I don't think that that's a result of there being a socialization process associated with them. Like, that's a result of the content of the system of gender itself. So, like, not all gender systems are like the one that we have here right now. Like, you know, there are systems of gendering where, you know, people don't, aren't super obsessed with the ability to, like, question all social norms, but there are more genders available. And so the harm and, like, better social opportunities available to the various genders, and so then some of the harms that feminists are worried about would be reduced or absent. Okay, Anais? Uh, also, thinking for your talk, I'm really sorry that I won't be like, uh, it's great, but I also wanted to ask for clarification on your view on autonomy, uh, because the fact that I'm kind of slightly confused by the literary example, because it seems to me it doesn't really matter whether you're saying you're recovering the original meaning of the tradition or you're reinterpreting it. You're still doing you know, critical assessment for it, it seems to me, right, regardless. And so, like, so, so is there a kind of autonomy that's to be valued by feminism if it's intellectual autonomy? And I think, like, I also don't know if you uh, handle the concept of modernism at all. Because I think there's something we do with, with modernism, which, you know, it's right to criticize like, the culturally specific Western uh, imperialist modernism, but like, that's not the only way to think of it, right? And there's also modernism that's just like, kind of emphasizing a critical approach to knowledge. And I'm, I'm teaching, I was teaching uh, Ibn Khaldun's Mukajima last Saturday with my class and we were talking about how this is actually like kind of a early modern text, even though it's centuries before the official start of modernism, right? And, <coughs> which is kind of uh, calling for a critical, rational approach to history, right? So is that something that should be valued by feminists? That's kind of like emphasizing intellectual autonomy that's not like by necessity rejecting tradition for it's the sake of rejecting it, but kind of like yeah, you know, being a bit autonomous in your thinking. Yeah, so um, I'll answer the question about autonomy first or the question about um, uh, about modernism second. So um, I agree that someone like Wadud is engaged in critical reflection, um, but I want I think it's important to separate autonomy from the part, like, the type of critical reflection that she's engaged in is thinking things should be other than as they are, right? Like, so all that that means is that you have a normative standard of some kind against which you are, um, co like, evaluating the world that you actually live in. Autonomy says something more than that you have a problem with the existing state of affairs. It says you are the source of the law on which you are evaluating the state of the affairs. Affairs, right? So, like, what autonomy definitionally is is like I am the source of evaluation that matters. So I'm saying you don't need that second thing, right? Like what somebody like Wadud is saying is I accept, like I don't see myself as the source of like where normative authority comes from, right? Like normative authority comes from somewhere else. I still have the ability to compare the existing state of affairs to this normative standard which comes from somewhere else. And I think when I describe it that way, like that's actually a very common form of moral reasoning, like even outside of religious people, right? Like where you're you think, oh, there's an external normative standard of some kind, like what I'm doing is comparing things to this external normative standard. 
and it's irrelevant how I feel about this external normative standard, whether it applies to me. Um, really quickly, there was a sub-question in there about like whether you need intellectual capacities to criticize things. Of course you do. I just think that rationality is an autonomy, right? Like, of course people need to be able to think to, um, to make decisions. Um, you could even, and I mean, I think like this is consistent with stuff I say in earlier work, like, you could even say that, like, actually, I'm going to take that back. Well, I, I'll, I'll settle with this. Like, that, um, you could say that a sort of, like, a thin kind of procedural autonomy helps feminism, but I don't even think it's right to, like, you need to say that it's necessary. Like, I think that at the end of the day, like, yes, you need to be able to think about stuff, but autonomy is a further step beyond thinking about and assessing stuff. It's a certain view about, like, what the source of normativity is. Um, the second, to go to your question about mod modernity, um, I'm not sure you're going to like this very much, but I just feel like, I don't know what we're getting out of calling all the like good progressive thinking things in the world modern, right? Like, it feels to me like it's a little, like the, the, the sleight of hand that happens there is that is trying to give Westerners and Europe a, like, a monopoly on thinking, right? Like, so if I find some, I don't know what text you were talking about, but certainly you see people, you know, try to um, look at texts that are, you know, come from before the modern period or come from non-Western cultures that emphasize the value of critical thought and then say, like, oh, they're modern texts. Like, what is the value added by calling them modern? Like, it seems like either it's, like, trying to say, like, oh, they, like, I just don't think it's escapable that you're, ultimately associating Europeanness with the morally valuable thing there. So I don't know why we're doing it. But it's not what I do. Go on. It's like, I, I, it was the recent thing of thinking of modernism as just a, a critical approach to thinking, right? That doesn't have to be linked to European thought or... So I know that like this is a thing that people do, but my point is like, I don't think you get to, <laughs> I don't mean this to sound as intense as it's about to sound, but like, <laughs> words have meanings independently sometimes of like what you stipulate for them in their, in this particular context. Like, I think it's very difficult, I could be really off base here, but it's really difficult for me to see like what is meant by calling something a modernity that doesn't end up associating it with Europe and European ideas. I have a bunch of questions. Thank you so much. That was so cool. I totally got a philosophy. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, I'm like super, super curious about like how you're teasing out thinking about advantage and how you evaluate advantage and disadvantage. Because I read the, the <coughs> politics of piety and it totally like. Yeah. Upended by like feminism, <laughs> and um, I'm just wondering, like maybe even specifically in relation to the double movement, like how would you go about evaluating that? Could just anybody evaluate that? Or, like, Great question. I've actually said question. Yeah. Well, so we should talk more, and I should just say that I mean, not that I'm trying to sell my work, but. The specific article about Mahmoud called, like, Do Muslim Women Need Freedom? is very much about the question that you're raising. Like, I wrote it basically saying, like, oh, Mahmoud leaves us in this super pessimistic place, but she didn't have to leave us in this pessimistic place. The reason I think she didn't have to leave us in this pessimistic place is that I thought that it was sad that she didn't separate traditionalism from feminism. Like, I think she was saying, like, we get left in this sad place where we don't know what to oppose because... We, we have a problem with the Dawa women. And I want to say, well, like, is the problem, is the source of our problem that they believe that you have to submit to tradition? Or is the source of the problem that they believe in sexism? Like, they happen to believe in both. But what I'm trying to make room for is that, like, you could have somebody who agreed with the Dawa movement about the relationship to tradition, but didn't agree with them about sexism. Um, in terms of the can anybody assess it thing, I think, and this is something I like, I used to talk a lot about in my early work, but I think the short answer to that is no, or at least that like, you need super rich information about a context in order to make judgments about how advantage and disadvantage works. And I think that so much of the critical literature about Western judgments about Muslim women is 
really just about that. Like people looking at practices and thinking that like, you know, they can walk up and look at the practice and know what its social meaning is. When like, in fact, the meaning is contextual. Um, and also the meaning has to do with like priorities and trade-offs. And the meaning has to do with history, right? Like what, what were things like five minutes before and what is this adding to what they're like now? And you can't know those things without really detailed contextual yeah, information. We have a bunch of more questions, so I'll turn it in. We can probably answer John. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, so, maybe I'll just like, tell you my intuition. <laughs> my, my intuition is like, there's nothing inherently imperialist about that. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mine too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I agree with like, but actually, my intuition is less about, of course I'm worried, about feminists who might be adopting certain kinds of materialist ideas or maybe a theory developing materialism in certain overt ways. I'm worried about that. Um, but more strongly, maybe my intuition is that not only is feminism not inherently imperialist, but maybe we need feminist theory to really be anti imperialist. Um, and so then I see your talk as being a sort of more than one of the things that's showing how they're not connected, right? But not so much talking about how we might need a certain kind of feminism be anti-imperialist. And maybe I'm a little worried about sort of the, the methodological strategy of the talk. Just kind of to, what I see, like really define feminism in a very circumscribed way. Um, and if you define it in this very circumscribed way, you can say, well, like, it's really not committed to many things except this one thing. And then clearly all these other things that maybe people charge imperialism to have to be committed to. Well, feminism doesn't have to be committed to that. Um, but then there's maybe a worry that maybe it's like too weak now. Whereas my, my positive intuition of thinking feminism can do like some real work, and it's really important to do that kind of work to be anti imperialist That kind of idea, I think, probably maybe isn't adopting the like the really weak understanding of this. Right? It's like thinking that there's something really thick and substantive and deep, valuable about feminism. Great. So um, I really like this question. To answer the first part about whether we want feminism to be anti-imperialist, like, um, I think my answer is nerdy about the structure of the argument, and it's just, yes, we want feminism to be anti-imperialist. That's like a goalpost of the argument the whole time rather than my actual argument. So like, I'm, I mean, all the time I am rejecting or accepting views on the basis of what they do to help fight imperialism. Um, so, I think that we want a feminism to be anti-imperialist. Um, I, like, I am saying that an adequacy criterion for the right type of feminism is that it will be useful in fighting imperialism. But, because of like, the, ver the various forms that imperialism takes and contextual difference, I don't necessarily think that it's, like, it's possible at this level of the project to say more about that. To go to the second point, um, and I'm just rushing because I'm uh, worried about that I'm getting um, told that I need to hurry, but like the, Sorry. no, no, it's okay. Um, no, the, um, the inclusive. no, right, nice. <laughs> no, so, <laughs> um, it's interesting that, so at first I thought you were just kind of like expressing like a thickness, thinness worry, and then I'm just like, yes, like all of the work that, of the type that I do is going to face this like too thick, too thin worry. But then at the end, you said something that I thought was really interesting, which was like, don't we want feminism to be really radical? And I think that part of the answer to that is yes, and that it's actually kind of thinking that all that I'm doing is thinning feminism is a just like, that's like a deceptive view about the structure of the argument. Like, in fact, if feminism is ending sexist oppression, like, it's much more demanding than what even Western Europe and the West have accomplished. So, it's very, feminism is very radical, it's just not radical liberalism, might be the, like, the, sorry, <laughs> two seconds, <laughs> I didn't even realize I was saying that. <laughs> Might, what one might be, but if I said it didn't have anything to do with well, it, it might be. 
and well, basically, it doesn't have to do with individuals. It's at the level of social groups that oppression occurs. So what I am saying is, I mean, so one is a big part of my project is that I don't want to commit to any very specific social ontology. So I could like. I think that there might be a number of social ontologies that are compatible with the view that there are social groups. To go to your, no, like, your specific are, question, so what is this? Well, so I, I am telling you that I don't know what like the exact definition of what one is. But the point that I was trying to make about individuals and oppression is that the object that is targeted in oppression is a group. It's not a single person. That doesn't mean that single persons aren't part of groups, but. The thing that gets subordinated is the group. But who does it target? I mean, it could it could be people, it could be groups, it could be like a system whose whose agent see we can't locate like. Well, I think I don't know what that means exactly, but, but um, you know that lots of people. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean I'm just wondering if, if your account is actually dialectical enough because you're allowing the whole <coughs> idea of individuality to be subsumed by liberalism by liberal interpretations, by either the idea of separateness, which is a very extreme liberal view, or the idea of, of self-subsistence. But if we take a more relational interpretation of individuals, then I think uh, you can overcome some of the, um, some of the uh, uh, extreme tensions in a different way. So I'm going to say one thing that I kind of have said to a lot of the questions, which is like maybe we can. That doesn't mean that we always should. Also, I think that once you take that path, and I'm very open actually to somebody producing a non-liberal form of individualism that is conceptually, no, but that is conceptually required for this, right? Because that's part of the project. Like, of course, if we keep the bounds of philosophy to just like with the concepts that like Western people have, this is the only way we can get from A to B, then of course I can see how we would end up in that kind of I mean, there are certainly people who describe their social ontology that's not including them. I don't like, and then of course, like no, we should have the a, actual people all over the world that you're talking about, the women you're talking about. Yeah, well, so some of them say that they like conceive of themselves as distinct and separate individuals, but I then there are distinct people. and separate. I just want individuals. I was just trying to argue you can separate out the distinct and separate from the idea of being an individual, and still retain an idea of being an individual. Okay, so relations. what we would need to do to like, in order for that to be important for my view is not just for it to be possible to retain such a view, but that it would need to be something that was like necessarily yes, I related. That, but I yeah. have to yeah. <laughs> I, I can argue it, but I have to restrain myself and have yeah. last question to Alice. So you said um, for us philosophers in the room, I take it some of us here. Um, <laughs> Your ver the version of autonomy that you're against in this presentation <coughs> is not the same as the moral autonomy from the philosophy of the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah, I conceded that explicitly. <laughs> yeah, but my worry is, like, should we be worried? On the one hand, I don't know whether we should be worried about that kind of autonomy from this perspective, or if maybe we need that kind of autonomy. I'm really just wondering where where your ideas connect with this more philosophical moral autonomy, since I'm not sure how many moral philosophers um, hold the sort of autonomy you're against. What um, would it do to the sort of autonomy we are interested in? So, I think the short answer to that, I mean, and, I mean you may or may not know this, but I am, like, have extensively <coughs> theorized about autonomy. So, I don't have a problem with theorizing about that autonomy. I think, one, it's not necessarily incumbent on this project to explain something about the value of that type of autonomy. So um, a lot of what I spend time talking about in the book about this particular value is like philosophers love to say that um, philosophers don't believe in this, but one, like, don't I get as a philosopher to analyze values as they exist in the actual world, and certainly the value that I describe is motivating lots of political action in the world. Um, but. The second thing is, I don't know why it would, all that I'm trying to say is that we have to acknowledge that like elements of the philosophy that we are doing in our departments like could have culturally specific elements and be related to very specific questions and forms of knowledge. 
So I'm not trying to say that we should, like, I'm not trying to say that somebody should step out of all, like, traditional norms and then create a new theory that comes from nowhere. But the, um, the thought is just that, so theorizing about that autonomy comes from here in a particular tradition, and let's be cautious then when we're using it to, like, understand, a, like, what value it has and be willing to subject it to certain kinds of scrutiny, including <coughs> scrutiny about how well it will travel, given that our interest in it is partly just dictated by the fact that people in our tradition happen to talk about it. Is there a two-minute question? You were the last one. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, well, join me in. Thank you.